Shall we open our Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3, continuing in our verse-by-verse study of the New Testament here on Sunday mornings. By the way, we're studying verse-by-verse of the Old Testament on Wednesday nights, and currently we're in the book of Joshua. So if you want to read ahead, please do so and come on out at 7 p.m. Uh, for our study on Wednesday nights in Joshua. But this morning, again, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 3, where we will read that ministry positions are verbs. They're not nouns. Ministry positions are things we do, not, not titles that we put on a piece of paper. They are verbs. They are not nouns. Now, as far as the background of this particular book, as many of you know, 1 Timothy is a, uh, it's an epistle. It's a letter that was written by Paul to his son in the faith, a young pastor named Timothy. Now, again, Paul wrote 1 Timothy. Can anybody tell me what other book of the Bible Paul wrote to Timothy? 2 Timothy, that's right. Looking for the obvious here, gang. Now, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and also the book of Titus. They're known as pastoral epistles because they were written by a pastor to young pastors about being pastors, about being ministers. The time of this writing, Paul had already been released from his first Roman imprisonment. And then, as he alluded to in the scriptures, which a tradition and history back up, Paul did go to Spain and minister there for a while. And apparently, Timothy was with him. Coming back from Spain, they went to Macedonia. And there, Paul remained for a while, but he sent Timothy on ahead to the city of Ephesus, to deal with some issues that were were going on there in the church of Ephesus. After Timothy departed, while Paul was still there in Macedonia, he wrote this letter and sent it on ahead to Timothy to explain more fully what Paul wanted Timothy to accomplish. Uh, To teach sound doctrine, for example. Also to define the roles of godly men and women in the church. To define the qualifications for pastors and deacons. And to generally just set things straight. Get things in order there in the church of Ephesus. Last time we ended with chapter 2, where Timothy was told to exhort and challenge the men and the women in their worship and in their service. First of all, men were told to pray more often than what men typically do. In 1 Timothy 2 verse 8, Paul said, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands and without wrath and doubting. So Pray more. Be more expressive in your worship and your prayers. And notice again, verse 8 is directed toward the men. Because typically, it's the women who pray more. Which means that many times, women are leading the charge in the spiritual battle in prayer for our homes and for our church and for our country. And this ought not to be. Men ought to be out there leading And so, as we said last week, hey men, let's all, and I include myself, let's all man up. Let's start praying more. Let's never let our wives beat us in who prays more, okay? But then he spoke to the women. And of course, if you were here last week, ladies, weren't you blessed? He uh, told the women to adorn themselves with inner beauty, not with outward bling bling. Notice in verse 9 of chapter 2, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel. You know, if there's any doubt that it might be cut a little too low, it probably is, just FYI. Uh, With propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. Don't let the outward be that which you were trying to attract people with or impress people by. But, verse 10, which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let it be the good works that are the, the focus of attention, not the, the latest, greatest, and hottest trends. Uh, also, women were told that there's only one function within the church that is strictly reserved for men. Verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. And then we were told what function is only for the women and never for the man. Notice in verse 15. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. And as I mentioned last week, I again say that this is a verse over which I have scratched my head on a number of occasions. I really don't know 
what the Lord is trying to get across. But the things I do glean is that I see that there's one thing a woman can do that a man cannot do. One function that God has called a woman to do that men cannot do, and that's childbearing. And let the men say amen. amen. Do any of you guys desire to, to birth a child? No. You know, we break out into cold sweat just thinking about it. That's not our calling. It's the lady's calling. And I certainly don't want to intrude upon that calling. And so the Lord says, as men shouldn't try to bear children, ladies, don't you try to be the senior pastor of a church. And that brings us now to chapter 3, where the Holy Spirit through Paul tells Timothy about qualifications for being a pastor or an overseer of the church. In verses 1 through 7, we have uh, the injunctions to a guy known as a bishop, elder, or pastor. We'll see that these are three terms that are used to describe one particular person. Verse 1. <coughs> this is a faithful saying. If a man desires a position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Now, the word bishop in the original Greek in which Paul originally penned this letter in is the Greek word episkopos, meaning a superintendent, a Christian officer in charge of a church. He is the one who is supposed to be in charge, the leader, the one who is out there leading, not one who is driving, but one who is leading. Now, in the pastoral epistle of Titus, this word bishop, it seems to be used interchangeably with the word elder to refer to the same guy. In Titus chapter 1, we read where Paul wrote to Titus and said, For this reason I left you in Crete. Just like Paul left Timothy in Ephesus, he left Titus in Crete that he should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders, uses the word elder there, in every city as I commanded you. Now, the elder, the, the Greek word there is presbuteros. So bishop is episkopos, from which the Episcopalian denomination derives its name. But then the elder is presbuteros, from which the Presbyterian denomination derives its name. The word presbuteros literally means an older man. It was a title that was originally given to each of the 70 members of the Jewish Sanhedrin, that religious and, and a, a political governing body of Israel. They were known as elders, and that's a title that carried over into the church to refer to the one who was overseeing the church. In Titus, the word elder is also used interchangeably with the title of bishop. For again, in verse 5 of Titus 1, this reason I left you in Crete, you should set in order things that are lacking, and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, a husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop, so he says in one breath, appoint elders, and if he's a good guy like this, for that bishop, see, uses two different terms to describe the same person. For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, and on and on and on. So again, in Titus, the titles of elder and bishop are used to describe the same person, the overseer of the church. Now, elsewhere in the Bible, the term pastor is used also to describe a title for the overseer of a church. So three titles used to describe the same person. Now, please don't call me Bishop John. For I don't know about you, but when I hear the word bishop, different things come to my mind. Guys with tall, pointy hats, or really active, flamboyant guys walking across the stage with sweat hankies constantly. That's not me. I am not those types of bishops. Those are definitions that you don't necessarily find in Scripture. So if you wouldn't mind, please don't call me Bishop, bishop John. Also, I'm not too fond of the term elder either. I like to think I still have a few good years left. Yeah, after the softball game last night, though, I, I, you know, maybe I'm in, I don't know. Anyway, back to 1 Timothy chapter 3. If somebody desires to be a bishop slash elder slash pastor, somebody feels called to that, a guy, you desire a good work. It's a good thing. 
If you're called to it, it is truly a good thing. Now, if you're not called to it, not all men are called to be pastor of the church. This church already has one, by the way. Just saying. But if you are called to be a pastor, then you desire a good thing. But you must meet certain requirements, and here they are. A bishop then must be blameless. Well, that disqualifies me. I might as well step down right now, right? Well, depends on what's meant by blameless. It doesn't mean perfect. Because after all, there's only one who's perfect, and that's Jesus. Now, he will come back one day to be the one and only pastor, the one and only groom for the bride of Christ. (coughs) But when it talks about blameless, he means blameless in the next few areas that follow. Notice the next part of verse 2. The husband of one wife. Now, just to let you know, I'm only married to Amanda. I've only ever been married to Amanda. And I am not interested in making a swap. Not interested, you know, in fact, she may want me out, but I never would anyway. Now, I digress. Does this mean, though, that the husband of one wife forever, or does it mean one at a time? After all, in the Greek and Roman cultures, polygamy was practiced. Now, some feel that this, when he says husband of one wife, this means that no one ever divorced can ever be a pastor. I don't know if I agree with that. Um, Because, you know, the people who hold that view, they say, well, you know, he would then be the husband of a second wife or a third wife or on and on and on. But what if the man's wife dies? If he remarried, would that disqualify him from being a pastor? I don't think so. I believe, and you may want to argue with this, and that's fine. You know, there's room for argument here. I believe, though, that this verse means that a pastor can't be married to more than one woman at a time, especially in light of the culture that Timothy and Paul were living in, where polygamy, married to many women at one time, was practiced. So he says, a husband of one wife, I think he means one at a time. Now, as far as the issue of divorce, we know that divorce is sin. And chances are, there's a whole lot, there are a lot of sins that were committed by even the man that would thus disqualify him from the pastorate. So it's an ugly situation. Whenever we talk about divorce, it's, it's, it's never a clean thing. It's kind of like that oxymoron, two words that don't go together, like military intelligence or... Um, <laughs> Or uncontested divorce. You know, somebody's mad. Somebody's contesting something. And so there are other things to consider if that should be the case. But when he's talking about this specific qualification, the husband of one wife, I think personally that literally it was one at a time. Anyway, going on. Temperate means under control, not given to excesses. Sober-minded, clear-thinking, level-headed, not carried away. Of good behavior, he doesn't cuss, doesn't tell dirty jokes, doesn't chase women, he doesn't get drunk. But, (coughs) conversely, he pursues righteousness and he encourages others to do so. Hospitable, he's inviting, he's friendly, he's caring. Able to teach, he has a gift. There is a certain gift of the Holy Spirit of teaching. Some people teach, and, and, and we appreciate those who try to teach the Word of God, but there are those who are anointed. And I, I think one of the acid tests is you're not always looking at your watch when the guy's teaching. Um, I would hope that you won't look at your watch from now on. Thank you. Uh, able to teach. The next one, not given to wine. Now, this is also a, an issue of debate. Some feel that you can't drink alcohol at all. No minister ever should. Others say, no, this, this means when it's not given to wine, that means not addicted to wine. And I don't want to enter into an argument. I'll just tell you personally, from, for, for me, I don't drink alcohol at all. Not even near beer. If, if you do, that's your business, but I don't. Uh, I do, though, make up for it in coffee consumption, but 
Uh, but as far as alcohol goes, I don't drink. And I certainly don't, even if I have liberty to do so, I don't want to use my liberty to cause somebody else to stumble. So, you know, whether it's um, out in public or even at home, if you open my refrigerator, you won't find any alcohol in there. Amanda, however, drinks like a fish. And No, I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. Told, she doesn't drink at all. and She doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, y- you know that that's wrong. That's why you're laughing so much, right? That can't be true. Of course, on the Internet, somebody's going to post something. Now, so uh, not given to wine. Not violent. By the way, if you're in a ministry position, be sensitive. Alcohol in our society uh, does have many times a stigma. Um, there, the, our society truly is one of excess, is it not? And addiction. And there are many people who have problems with alcohol. A lot of Christians who, who at one time were, were, were uh, drunks, uh, drug users, and, and they've come to faith in Jesus, and the Lord has set them free, and they're delivered and those people don't understand how another Christian can have a, a beer uh, or a glass of wine with their meal. They, to them, alcohol means getting drunk only, getting high or whatever. And so in ministry, we need to be sensitive to that and not allow our liberties to cause somebody else to stumble, whether it's alcohol or whatever it might be. Uh, so not given to wine, not violent, not one to pick a fight. You know, a, more of a dove rather than a hawk. Not greedy for money. He spends his time ministering to people, not trying to line his pockets. But gentle, <coughs> not quarrelsome. He doesn't want to even argue. The Bible even says a servant of the Lord must not argue. You know, my job is to preach, to call it like I see it, tell it as I see it here in the Word. Now, if somebody wants to argue or debate, I'm really, you know, if, if they have scriptural grounds to prove me wrong, then yes, I'll listen and, and we'll talk about it. But if somebody just wants to argue, I, I don't like arguing. I hate confrontation. I really do. You know, it's my hope and dream that everybody likes one another and gets along and we don't have drama or problems. And that's what I'd like to believe is, is our situation here. And, you know, as the saying goes, if the stew don't stink, don't stir it. You're like, what's saying? <laughs> that means if things are fine, don't try to stir something up. Okay, you learned something here. So, n- gentle, not quarrelsome, also not covetous. He's not interested in longing for a bigger church and a bigger salary. He was a pastor of a small church. Came home and said, honey, guess what? The big church in a couple of towns over called me. And asked me to come and be their pastor. It's a bigger church and more money. What do you think? And wife said, well, let's, let's go uh, you know, pray about that. And he says, oh, no, no, no. I'll go pray. You start packing. <laughs> you see, he's already made his mind up. He just wanted the bigger and better. Also, the, the bishop slash elder slash uh, pastor is one, verse 4, who rules his own house well having his children in submission with all reverence. For, if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? It's a good question. You know, I think that if a man desires to be a pastor, a minister, he better make sure he has a good woman by his side. And you know, the, like I do, without question. The best wife, best mom of the world I believe has ever seen. And it's to her credit that our kids are so well adjusted. That's right. Give them a No, don't give me. It's not even Mother's Day. I mean, if you can see, if I if I was alone was raising my kids, boy, they'd really be messed up. So, anyway, not a novice, not a young believer, not somebody who's recently come to the faith, not a newbie. Lest being puffed up with pride. He fall into the same condemnation as the devil. You know, a minister's biggest test does not come with defeat. A minister's biggest test comes with success. When something great happens, that's when the minister. That's when, if, if the Lord does something great through you, that's 
your biggest test right there. How are you going to handle it? Now, the devil, formerly known as Lucifer, was a created angel, and he was beautiful in appearance, multi-talented. But yet, instead of giving his creator the glory, Lucifer tried to take glory for himself. In Isaiah 14, (coughs) we read, How you were fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you were cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation in the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Ezekiel tells us that he was the the seal of perfection, beauty, until sin was found in him and the sin was pride. Instead of giving God the credit, wow, you've made me like this, Lord. Thank you. You go, God. Look at what you can do. Instead of doing that, he thought, wow, I'm pretty neat. I look at that man in the mirror and I like what I see. I know I'm going to try to be like God. After all, I got so much going for me. At that point, the Lord says, yet you will be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest parts of the pit, lowest depths of the pit. It can happen to any man. You remember Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, looking at the glory of his kingdom, and he said, look at this great Babylon that I have built. Taking credit for what God had done through him. And at that very moment, the Lord struck him with madness, rebuking him for taking credit for what only God can do. So if we ever have success as Christians in our our Christian ministry, even at work or at school, be careful not to take any glory to yourself. Be careful to give all glory to God. Typically novices, people young in the faith, if they're thrust into ministry, can kind of get excited about what's going on and think, whoa, you know, I was a good find. No. God was just looking. God was just looking for somebody breathing, walking, talking, and available. And the talking part was even optional. (laughs) God's just looking for availability. Moreover, verse 7, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So probably wouldn't be a good idea to have a police record. (coughs) Billy Graham told a group of young ministers, gave them this general, general model, this general rule of thumb. He said, number one, don't touch the women. Number two, don't touch the money. And number three, don't touch the glory. In verses 8 through 13, we come to another office in the church, and it's that of deacons. And again, deacon is not a noun, it's a verb. The Greek word for deacon is diakonos, which literally means one who runs on errands. He's an attendant. He's a waiter at a table or other menial duties. He's a servant. The Bible also mentions ladies who served as deaconesses. In Romans 16, where Paul says, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant, a diakonos. Same word there for deacon. Uh, She's a deacon of the church in Centria. And like pastors, deacons must meet certain requirements, certain qualifications. Verse (coughs) 8. Likewise, deacons must be reverent. In other words, spiritual first. Spiritual first. Those who serve here as deacons, or just those who serve at all, I sure hope that first and foremost, we are praying people, more so than doing people. And I've always found that the more I pray, the more I do get done. And better too. So, Deacons must be reverent, spiritual first, not double-tongued. They won't say one thing to your face and then another behind your back. These deacons, good deacons, are those who have your back, not those who are trying to put a knife in it. Not given to much wine. That's interesting. 
Apparently they may drink wine, just not much of it. You know, all Christians are forbidden from being drunk, being inebriated, being, being drunk. But apparently, deacons are free to consume a little wine. Uh, verse 8, or the next part, not greedy for money. Uh, this is especially necessary because deacons many times process the tithes and offerings. You give to the Lord a portion of what God has so abundantly blessed you with as you're worshiping God there at the agape boxes. At that point, the money's collected by at least two guys, and two guys then take it into an office, and they count it, and they fill out the deposit slip, and they make sure that on the computer those who gave are credited for what they have given. Then at the end of the year, we print out the tax-deductible receipts. We always have two people at least processing the tithe. And we don't need greedy guys in there either, especially when they're handling the finances. And then verse 9, holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience so they know the truth about the faith and they also do it. They know that they're saved and they know that they're right with, with the Lord. But verse 10, let these also first be tested. Trial period. And then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Again, deacons, not a, not a noun but a verb. They're servants. You know, deacons are assistants, ultimately. They, they help the pastor implement the vision God has planted in the pastor's heart. They're the ones who help the pastor get her done. Now, a person is a deacon who is serving the Lord and his people. Maybe they haven't been given the official title, but yet in God's eyes, they're deacons because they're serving. You know, whoever wants to be a deacon can be one. You've read the qualifications? The only thing you need to do is serve. And then as far as God is concerned, you are a deacon or a deaconess. Now, if you're a male and you're a deacon, it says in verse 11, likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers. Their women shouldn't be gossipers or men for that matter. Temperate and faithful in all things. Ladies, you can count on. Let deacons be the husband of one wife. Ruling their children, their own houses well. <coughs> for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You know, good deacons and deaconesses are such a great blessing. God truly is looking for some good men and some good women who will deke for him. God's looking for people to deke. In verses 14 through 16, Paul expresses his future plans and also his praise to God. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. Now, history teaches us because the Bible was written and, and the, uh, the, the history of the Bible ends with Paul in jail in Rome. And then his second imprisonment is briefly mentioned in the book of 2 Timothy. But in between his first and second imprisonment. After his first imprisonment, he went to, as I said earlier, went to Spain. Then he traveled to Macedonia where he sent Timothy on and then penned this letter, 1 Timothy. Then eventually he did make it to Ephesus. But at that point he was rearrested by the Roman government was hauled back to Rome, was thrown into the Mamertine prison, into the, one of the deepest dungeons of the prison. And there he awaited his trial where a raving lunatic known as Caesar Nero ordered him to be beheaded. And so Paul here is in Macedonia before going to Ephesus, before his next arrest and imprisonment and subsequent beheading. And he says to Timothy, I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed... I write to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Hey, did you notice? Did you notice who is the pillar and the ground of truth? The pillar, and the, that's, a, that's a huge title. Who's given that title? The pillar and the ground of truth. No. 
He is, but in this verse, who are addressed as the pillar and the ground of truth? It's the church. Again, notice, he says, you know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. In other words, you and I, we are the source of truth. The world doesn't have truth. The world has turned its back on Jesus. They don't know the truth. The only way for them to know the truth is through the church. You and me. We're the ones who have the truth. We know the truth. And here's the truth that we need to tell them. Verse 16. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Let me ask you, who here wants to be godly? Anybody here want to be godly? Of course, we all do. Well, here, the mystery of godliness is revealed. Here it is. And you'll find out that it's all about believing the right things about Jesus. God was manifested in the flesh. First of all, he wasn't just some ethereal spirit who floated above the ground and never left footprints. Fully God, yes, but also fully man. We read in John chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The incarnation, God taking on human flesh. So, the mystery of godliness is revealed. Number one, God was manifested in the flesh. Number two, justified in the Spirit. Remember in Scripture when Jesus was baptized, and at that moment the Holy Spirit came upon Him in the form of a dove. And then a voice was heard from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. There, Jesus was justified in the Spirit before all people. Next part. Seen by angels. Eternity past and eternity future. Preached among the Gentiles. By the end of the first century, the gospel had been preached to the entire known world without advertising, without the internet, without Salesmen calling you up every day to say, we have a super effective way of ministering to your community if you'll only pay us money. I get that all the time. You know, I have to applaud this one guy who called last week, and I'm totally digressing and I don't care. But he called and he was just, man, that guy was a salesman. When they asked you, he said, certainly you would agree that the church needs to do a better job of reaching out, don't you? You agree, don't you? Which is a sales technique for I'm going to slip my hands further, deeper into your pocket to grab some money out of it. Certainly you would agree, wouldn't you? What am I going to say? Nah, I think the church needs to keep doing the lousy job it's doing. I said, what are you trying to sell me? He says, well, we can give you mailing lists of people that come in and and pre-sticky labels to put on your envelopes or your mailers, and it's an effective and powerful. And I said, you know, we, we find the best advertisements word of mouth. Yeah, but don't you agree? Wouldn't you agree that most people in the church aren't inviting their friends and neighbors? Like, you know... After a while, I said, you know, I I appreciate what you're doing, but I'm going to hang up the phone. And I was nice. I wasn't quarrelsome, because I'm not allowed to be here. I just read that passage. (laughs) Like, man, I can't be quarrelsome. Oh, bummer. But I said, I, okay, I appreciate, but I'm going to hang up the phone. He goes, well, wait, just before you do. I said, no, I promise you, I'm going to hang up the phone, and I keep my promises. But wouldn't you click? I told him, I'm going to hang up the phone. Mm, we, got, we as Christians keep our word, don't we? <laughs> but you know, before mailers, before pre-pasted address envelopes, before newspaper ads, hey, we got a special, I got another call. That same day, got a special in, in this little paper that goes to three neighborhoods and 25 bucks for a two inch by two inch ad. Before all that, the gospel, in, by the end of the first century, had reached everybody. Why? Because people were in love with Jesus and they were 
burden for lost souls. So they did something about it. They went out telling people. Jesus preached among the Gentiles. Next part of verse 16. Believed on in the world. Multitudes came to faith in Jesus. Hey, here we are on the other side of the globe. 2,000 years later. And we're believing in Jesus. Great is the mystery of godliness. And then finally, received up in glory. Jesus rose from the dead. And 40 days later, he ascended into heaven. At the time, he was speaking to his disciples. In Acts chapter 1, verse 9, And now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up. He started to, to rise. Started to fly. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, they, they just were looking at him this way, and then all their heads are pointing upward, and I'm sure their jaws dropped. They were stunned. They were shocked. And, they, and, and finally, the cloud takes him, and he's gone, and they're just frozen there. And while they kept their eyes gazed upward, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Two angels just appeared like that. Who also said, Men of Galilee. Now you can imagine your, your eyes are fixed upward and all of a sudden two guys are talking to you that weren't there a moment ago. Ah! You know, what would you say? Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. You saw him go up, guess what? He's coming back down. He's coming back again. So great is the mystery of godliness. Without controversy, God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. This mystery of godliness, which is now revealed, causes us to live godly in this present age when we embrace Jesus as our Savior and Lord. By believing the right things about him, we enter into a right relationship with him. If I don't believe the right thing about another person, if I think they've done things they haven't done, said things they haven't said, that's going to affect our relationship, isn't it? We will not have a right relationship. We need to know the right things about Jesus So that we can have a right relationship with him. And guess what? God's taken all the guesswork out of it. He's given to us his word, the Bible. The more we read the Bible, the more we know Jesus. And then the better relationship we have with him. And also, I love the fact that he ends up there received up into glory. Because as Jesus was received up in glory, guess what? So what? So will you and me. We also will be taken up in glory. In 1 John we read, Beloved, now we are children of God. If you trust in Jesus, you're a child of God. You've been adopted into his family. There's only only one begotten son, but you are adopted as a son or daughter of God. Now we are children of God. Okay, that's today. What about tomorrow? What about the future? What's going to happen? It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. In our wildest dreams, we cannot imagine the glorious transformation that will take place in all of us. Beyond, beyond our wildest dreams. Not been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, when Jesus comes back for us, we shall be like him. We'll be changed. In a moment, a twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ rise first. We who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to instantly be transformed from corruptible to incorruptible into spiritual beings. I read in the Gospels after Jesus rose from the dead how he was able to walk through walls, disappear and reappear. That's cool. That's going to be great. That'll be a whole lot of fun, won't it? In in the uh, millennial kingdom, we in our glorified bodies are going to be given positions of authority over places in the world, over people. To rule and reign with Jesus. There will be some people who actually survive the tribulation. And they will grow old and and in the process have children and families. They'll be earthly people. Everybody has their own date with death. 
But we, in our glorified body, we get to rule and reign with Jesus over those who have not yet entered into eternity. They're in the kingdom, but they're still earthly, haven't yet been transformed. We'll be able to appear and and disappear while they're still in their physical bodies. That's going to be interesting, won't it? Think of the possibilities. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope, are you hoping for the Lord to come back for you? Everyone who has this hope purifies himself. If we believe Jesus could come back today, won't that keep us from some things we know we ought not to be doing? He who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. The mystery of godliness. God manifested in the flesh, justified in spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And one day, so will we. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, we recognize that these qualifications for <clears throat> pastors and deacons are, are really qualifications that we all, Lord, should live up to. But we need your power, your glory. You're anointing to be able to do the things you call us to do. So, Lord, would you do that? And, Lord, if you wouldn't mind, would you come back today? It's a beautiful day for you to come back. But until you do, Lord, help us to be burdened for souls, to be in love with you, and to get the message out. Thank you, Lord, for this time in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.